All right, we're going to finish up a few month study in the book of Nehemiah. If this is your first Sunday with us, you picked a great day to hang out. We're going to recap where the story has been and then see where it lands. We've said from the beginning, Nehemiah is a story of renewal. Renewal is to be made new again, to be renewed, made new again. There are parts of us in our life that wants to be made new again. And how do we do that? And so we've been looking at the story of Nehemiah. And this story was about the people of God who have been living outside the land of promise in a place called exile in Babylon. They've had many different countries come and oppress them, own them, enslave them. And now as God has promised, he's going to bring them back to the land of promise and renew not only the city, not only the wall, not only the temple, but he's going to renew the people. And the very first page of Nehemiah, we learn that the renewal process always starts in reality. This is when Nehemiah received the news that his brothers and sisters were in ruins. The wall had not been rebuilt. People around him had been harassing them. They were oppressed. No one cared for their welfare. And he had to admit reality for renewal to begin. This is when we no longer pretend like our life is more put together than it actually is. This is when we no longer pretend that the decisions that we made didn't have the consequences that they actually have. This is when we no longer pretend to be something that we're not. We own up and face up to our reality. And that's where all renewal starts. And then then the renewal process can begin because it's a process. And it begins by returning to God. If God's the giver of life and we want to be renewed, made new again, have our lives put back together, we return to God. That's where the process begins. And then we saw that Nehemiah began to pray. He prayed for many days. And it's this prayer that readies us for whatever comes in the renewal process, because it's not quick, it's not easy, it can be painful, it can be long. And so our connection with God, talking to God, hearing from God, prepares us to meet whatever comes next in the renewal process. And then we saw that Nehemiah had to face outside opposition. He had to resist external opposition, those who would try to persuade him to stop the work. That would try to discourage him from the work that he was doing. This is when he had to reply, I'm doing a great work and I can't come down. I can't be distracted. I must remain focused. It was his prayer life that made him ready to face the outside opposition. It also readied him to face what was happening internally. He had to remove internal rot from the people. Remember, he had to come and address the people and say, you are no longer caring for the most vulnerable in the community. You have perverted and neglected justice. You must turn back and do what you were called to do. Be the people of God of justice and mercy and walking humbly with your God. So we had to remove the rot that was within the community of people. And that's where they recommitted. They heard the words of God and they recommitted their life. They said, we're recommitting to the covenant, what God called us to be. We are now recommitting our life and our focus. And they had three areas that they signed, they signed their name to a contract. And they said, we will do it once again. We looked at this in chapter 10, where they recommitted to saying, we will not let our families marry into the culture. We're not going to marry our families into the culture that doesn't love God, that doesn't love the justice of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, the affections of God. We're going to remain separate as the people of God. And we promise to keep the Sabbath We've been neglecting the one day a week that God has called holy where we would cease from our labors and that the culture around us would recognize that we live on a different rhythm than them. And we will cease from trades and purchases and we will remind ourselves that our trust comes from God, our provisions come from God, our protection comes from God, and we will honor the Sabbath day. And then lastly, they said, we will no longer neglect the house of God. We will bring in our tithes and our offerings so that the worship center would have all that it needs so that the people would be able to gather and worship. And they signed their name to it. And then in chapter 11 and 12, all these names of people that are moving back into the city are listed and they have this epic worship center service. We haven't seen this yet where, where they respond to the fact the wall has now been rebuilt 
And they put choirs up on the wall, the wall that their adversary said, that's so feeble, it's so weak. If a fox runs on that thing, it's going to fall down. Now they got choirs on it singing about the faithfulness of God. And chapter 12 ends. And Nehemiah continues to be the governor, the leader for 12 years. For 12 years, he's away from the capital of Babylon serving here. He's away from our Xerxes, who is the leader of the Persian Empire, serving as the governor in Jerusalem for 12 years. At the end of 12 years, he returns back to the capital. He goes back to Persia. Because remember, when he left our Xerxes, our Xerxes asked him, you can go, you can rebuild, I'll resource this thing. When will you be back? Like he was really important in their economy in their kingdom. When will you return? And it's been 12 years, and now he's ready to return. And when the cat's away, the mice play. Nehemiah leaves after 12 years, and there's another word that comes in, is relapse. The people relapse away from all the things they just recommitted to. And you kind of wish Nehemiah ended in chapter 12. You're like, come on. I mean, like, that's how Hollywood does it. There's a story. There's good. There's bad. There's opposition. And then the good guy comes in. He removes everything. He fights back against evil. It's all kind of sewn up in this beautiful bow. And then the story ends, and they lived happily ever after. I mean, you've been at church where there's testimonies. Give me a testimony. Someone's like, and then God came in and changed my life, and I'm all for Jesus. We're like, yeah. And they walk off the stage and they live perfectly into Jesus forever. (laughs) It can kind of be a downer that there's chapter 13. Chapter 13 is this relapse where they break all their commitments again. I'm so glad it's there. Because it's the real life these people live, that they're familiar with. It's the real life I think, in some respects, you've experienced. At the very things you said to God, I will never do that again. You found yourself doing again. That's my story. And so Nehemiah once again comes back to Jerusalem. And we're going to find what is it that meets the people in relapse? What does Nehemiah do? So grab your Bible. We're going to Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah 13, we'll start in verse 4. Now before this, Eliashib, the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God, and who was related to Tobiah. Tobiah was one of the adversaries towards Nehemiah. Eliashib, the high priest, has been partaking in the work. We've seen him mentioned in rebuilding the wall effort. But he's related to Tobiah, and this is what he did. He prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they had previously put the grain offerings, the frankincense, the vessels, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil, which were given by commandment to the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priests. While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king. And after some time, I asked leave of the king and came to Jerusalem. Let's stop right there. Can you imagine Nehemiah? He's back in Babylon. He's away from the worship center, the prayer meetings, the sacrifices. He's in this pagan country again. And he's probably longing to get back to Jerusalem. Like, I want to be with my people. I want to be with the people that love God, fear God, worship God, and now I'm serving here again, and it's good. I mean, it pays the bills, and I've got a good job, and I'm appreciated here, but I want to be back with my people, and so he's longing to be back with his people. He asks Artaxerxes, "Can can I go back one more time? Can I have leave? And he's granted leave, but this is what he comes back to, verse 7. And I came to Jerusalem, and then I discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And I was very angry and threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I gave orders and they cleansed the chambers. 
I brought back there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offerings and the frankincense. He gets back, and, and the last thing probably that was said was, we will not neglect the house of God, Nehemiah. Safe travels. And he heads back for a period of time. We're not sure how long that time is. It takes several months just to get back to the capital. He's there at least eight months, maybe a year, if not more, maybe multiple years. And he comes back, and the first thing he sees is that they've neglected the house of God. And that this priest was by faith only by word of mouth, not true of heart. And he's brought in Tobiah into the chamber where they gather the offerings that were to the religious leaders. And I love what Nehemiah does. He's angry, and he goes in there, and he grabs the couches, he grabs the clothes, and he just throws it on the front lawn. It's like, we're evicting someone today. He evicts the dude, throws all his stuff out, cleanses this chamber room that was given to Tobiah. And then he notices that people have stopped bringing in their gifts. They continue to neglect the house of God. Look at verse 10. I also found out that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them. So that the Levites, that's the religious leaders, and the singers who did the work had fled each to his field. So I confronted the officials and said, why is the house of God forsaken? Neglected, you signed your name in the recommitment to no longer forsake, neglect the house of God. And that's the very first thing you did. That's the first offense. Verse 15. In those days, I saw in Judah people treading wine press on the Sabbath and bringing in heaps of grain and loading them on donkeys and also wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of loads, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them on the day when they sold food. They neglected the Sabbath, the very thing they said they wouldn't do anymore. Now they've reinstituted the businesses, the commerce in Jerusalem. And he reminds them, is this not why we went into exile in the first place? And now we're doing it again. He actually goes to the business owners that have come to Jerusalem to sell goods. And he tells them, you're no longer welcome here. He closes the gate. They come and they stand by the gate. And this is what Nehemiah says, verse 21. But I warned them and said to them, why do you lodge outside the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. And he doesn't mean like a prayer gathering, lay hands on them. Right? This is like physically removing them from their place. Why? Because it's wrong. He's there to keep the covenant. He's been living in renewal with the people, and it's still true of him. It says, from that day on, they did not come on the Sabbath. They knew I was serious. Then I commanded the Levites that they should purify themselves and, and come and guard the gates to keep the Sabbath day holy. He, he brings in the leadership again and says, this is what you're called to do. Stand by the gates. Keep the Sabbath holy. Reminds, we have a different rhythm than the culture around us. This is a distinction for us. Help the people keep it. And so he reinstitutes leadership doing the right thing, even though they abandon the Sabbath. And then we're going to see that they jump in again with culture. Verse 23, in those days, I saw the Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. These are countries that do not love God. This is not a racial thing in any way. This is a theological thing. Their, their families are coming together with families that don't love God, that don't love the ways of God. I mean, some of these families are practicing child sacrifice. And they're bringing that into their family unit. Verse 24, and half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, and they could not speak the language of Judah, but only the language of each people. I mean, they, they've lost their vernacular to know what, what God's like. They, they don't know what, what grace is, what sin is, what forgiveness is. They don't even know those words anymore. They can't read the scriptures and understand them. And so I confronted them and I cursed them and beat some of them and pulled out their hair, probably their beard hair, because that's a sign of disgrace. Pulled out their hair and I, and I made them take an oath in the name of God saying, you shall not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. In fact, one of the sons that began to just bring in these families that did not love God or the ways of God or the justice of God or the mercies of God was actually the grandson of the high priest, 
Eliashib, the one who's renting the room at the temple. It's his grandson that might be leading this. And so in verse 30, here's a capture of what Nehemiah came back to do. Three things. Thus I cleansed them from everything foreign. I established the duties of the priests and Levites, each in his work. And I provided for the wood offering at appointed times for the first fruits. And it ends with this refrain that he's actually said after each episode, and we catch it here, remember me, oh my God, for good. Like when he addresses Tobias, remember me, my, my faithfulness, that I am with you, remember me. This is a private prayer. Remember, he's not doing any of this for power, for a position, for prestige. He, he's doing this because it's the right thing to do for the people of God. Remember me, oh my God, for good. And so what we should see in, the, in this 13th chapter, in the midst of relapse, is that God's grace still meets him there. That's what Nehemiah is. Nehemiah is sent back to the people who have relapsed from their recommitments to bring grace again. Nehemiah is an extension of God's grace to meet people so that they can restart the process of renewal. In relapse, God's grace meets us so that we can restart. That's what Nehemiah 13 is all about. Because the process of renewal is not just up to the right. This is great. It's all good. And then I gave my life to Jesus and nothing bad happened ever again. I never made another mistake. It's as I am pursuing, as he is renewing. There are times when I do the thing I, I said I would never do again. And would God give up on me there? No, Nehemiah said, this is who God is. He is faithful. He is steadfast. He will not cast off or forsake his people. Though they have been faithless again, God remains who he is, faithful. God is faithful to meet all of us, even when we say we will never do that, and we do it again. And so Nehemiah's grace. Now, that grace comes a bit abruptly. I mean, people are getting evicted. People are getting their beard hair torn out. Sometimes when, when we have our hidden lives of sin and it's exposed, we think that's judgment. Oh, that's not judgment. That's grace. It's God's grace to interrupt us when we are living away from him. It's his judgment when he says, I'll just give you over to you uninterrupted. And I'll let those seeds of bitterness, of unforgiveness, of hate, of anger just continue to grow in you. And I won't even bother you anymore. That's hellish. It's his grace that comes and evicts the sin. Evicts what's wrong. Exposes what's wrong. Even to our dismay. And he does this because he loves us. Now, now let's, let's trace how this happens, okay? So how does this relapse happen? Because it doesn't happen just in a moment. It happens by small decisions over time. So let's go back to the very beginning. In the very beginning, the high priest, Eliab, Eli Eliashib, gave a room in the temple to Tobiah. It's just a room. That's all it is. It's not just about like Tobiah needing a place to stay. Like, oh, this would be a great apartment for you. It's, hey, Tobiah's kind of a big deal in town. This could win me some favors. It'll go, for me, go well for me and my family. And so I'll just extend a favor. It's just a room. That's all it is. It's not a big deal. It's just a room. Nothing's going to happen. Well, then what happens? Is the room he gave them is the house that collected, that stored all the grain offerings for the worship leaders of the temple. And so people are coming and showing up, and they're saying, okay, I brought my grain offerings that we committed to. And they say, oh, well, uh, whew, um, we don't really have room. We don't have room for that. Uh, that room is rented by Tobiah. So you know what? Why don't you just hang on, hang on to those gifts and offerings? You can use them for your family. We, we, we don't have a place to hold on to them here. So they say, okay, well then let's not give our grains and offerings. And they just take them back home. Well, then the priests and the Levites and the singers and the worship leaders of the temple are like, well, hold on a second. Some of those grains and offerings were to go for the provisions of me and my family. And we can't eat. And so we can't keep leading the worship here. So, you know, what we got to do is we got to go back, it says, to our fields. And we're going to start working back in our fields so we can provide for our families, and so now the worship at the temple is no longer happening. 
And so then people are like, well, okay, if the worship's no longer happening, why are we, why are we taking a Sabbath? Like we're pausing for a day, but then there's no activity happening at the worship center. So why are we stopping to work? It's not economically beneficial to us. And so let's, let's like, you know, start selling and buying again on the Sabbath day. Let's bring in some of those businesses from abroad. Let's bring them back in. They can start selling and we can start buying and it'll be good economically for us. And now there's no longer a day in which reminds the people that they're distinct from the culture around them, that their trust and their provision and their protection is from God. And so it's like, well, let's just see if we can just link arms with them. Let's like join family units with them. That would be beneficial to us. And so let's give our sons and our daughters to people that they don't, they don't love God, but it's not a big deal. Like, like, we don't Sabbath. They don't Sabbath. They don't worship. Well, we don't worship. How did we get here? It's just a room. That's how we got here. It's just one room. It's not a big deal. And you can't see how renting a room to Tobiah leads all the way down to the, the lack of worship, the neglect of the worship center, all the way to, to, to neglecting the Sabbath to now embracing the culture around them because you're no longer culturally distinct. How do we get here? It's just one room. You see how you get here? It's one small compromise that we can't foresee where it leads us. Just one, one small thing that gets us so far off course that we don't even recognize ourselves. And so think about your life in the sense of rooms in which you live. Do you ever tell yourself, it's not a big deal. It's just a movie. It's just one trip. It's just one opportunity it's just one, what is it? It's just in the living room. I mean, it's, it's just in the bedroom, no one else's business. It's just in the closet. No one even looks in there. It's just what? You fill it in. It's just what? It's just a room. Now, I know you're thinking this, bro, you are sounding like a legalist. And God's grace is not about legalism. You're sounding legalistic. This is not legalism. This is wisdom. Do you know what a legalist is? It's someone who lives a more strict life than you. That's all a legalist is, really. It's like, well, you're more strict than me. And I don't want to feel guilty, so you're a legalist. And I live under the grace of Jesus. I mean, that's not totally true, but oftentimes we label people legalists because it's really uncomfortable to talk about the things that we have given rooms to. And I just want to be a Nehemiah for you. And I don't want you to get yourself somewhere you never imagined being in the first place because you just gave up one room. Let's not do that. And so we got to do what Nehemiah does in our own life and say, okay, we got to evict somebody. We got to evict something. We got to cast it out. We got to throw that out on the front lawn and say, this is the worship center of God. We got to do what Jesus does when he turns over tables and he says, this is the Lord's house, the house of prayer. What are you doing bringing in commerce in here? It's a bit aggressive, I get it, but it's in our own life. We just got to tear that out. And we got to recommit to the rhythms and practices of the people of God so that we remain distinct from the people that I don't love God. It's not mean. It's faithful. But we do this in mercy and gentleness and love. That's how we do it. The brother of Jesus, Jude, he writes this to this church in his, in his letter, warning the church about Tobias, who are coming in looking for just one room in the church. Jude Three says, Beloved, although I was eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. But to what we gave you, the faith in Jesus Christ. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people 
who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. There are people that come in and take up a room and they're like, the grace of Jesus is really the license to do whatever you want, whenever you want. It's just all grace. God loves, God forgives, you go. Don't be a legalist. And he says, hey, I've written you to contend for the faith. Don't give them a room in your life. Don't give them a room. And this is what it calls you to. Verse 20, you don't have to be angry. This is not being hateful. Verse 20, but you, Christian, beloved, building yourself up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. That's where we are to stay, is the love of God waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And how are we to act towards people? And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment that's stained by the flesh. And so if you got doubts this morning and you think, man, we're going to be angry towards you. No, I got so much mercy for you. This place has so much mercy for you to explore your faith to question, to bring your doubts. If you've been living a life that's like so far from the life you want to have been living and you know that you need to be renewed, this place has got so much mercy and grace for you. Do you know why? Because God's got so much mercy and grace for you. He's got so much of it for you. And that's what we're here to do, is to help one another stay in the process of being renewed. Now, if you look at Nehemiah and say, cool, is it inevitable? Is there any renewal that will actually stick? Or does it just end up being relapse after relapse? Well, two things. One, when you experience a relapse, you don't start again in the, in the same exact place. That can feel so defeating. It's like, oh, my gosh, I messed up again. And now i got to start all over. No, you don't. You've been walking with God, and God's been doing some great things. All over is Nehemiah 1. Like, hey, I learned about the walls that are torn down, and the people are in ruins, and no one's caring about the welfare of the people. That's not where they have to restart. Remember, they're in Jerusalem. They have the walls. They have the temple. Where do they have to start? It's just begin again in their recommitments. They don't have to go all the way back to chapter 1. They can begin here where they are. And so it's not going all the way back to the beginning, but it's a grace that meets us in relapse so that we can start again, begin again. And that's what they do. That's what the Nehemiah does. Now, the second thing is this. We need a greater Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a prototype of Jesus Christ. It's God's grace coming to his people to renew them. But he's renewing them under an old covenant. Paul calls this covenant given by Moses a covenant of death. The law written on stone tablets and you're trying to bring your life into conformity to these stone tablet rules, and it never can. In fact, when Moses would meet with God, his face would shine with all this glory, Paul says. But when he would depart, that glory of being with God would actually fade because that, that covenant was not meant to be permanent. It wasn't lasting. But Jesus Christ comes to bring a new covenant a covenant established in his death and in his sacrifice and in his works. And that covenant is an eternal covenant that you can actually change and it can stick. And so Paul says this in 2 Corinthians, talking about these two different covenants. By ending in verse 18, he says, And we all with unveiled faces, like Moses' unveiled faces, but different, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of our Lord, are being transformed, being renewed, being changed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Jesus Christ came to do what Ezekiel the prophet, Jeremiah the prophet said that God would do, is remove from us a heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh and write his, his commands on our hearts, his ways on our hearts, so that our hearts would actually long to do those things. And Jesus says, okay, well, I'll come and I'll, I'll change them in a different way. I will conform them to the image of me. Right. Remember, Jesus is fully God, fully man. So he shows us what it looks like to be fully human. And he wants to press us into that image. How does that happen? What well, happens from beholding him and practicing the things that Jesus practiced, doing the things that Jesus 
did. He's the new Nehemiah, the better Nehemiah, who teaches us what it is to be renewed, not into our own image, but into the image of him. And so we're going to start a series next week that takes us through the summer called Formed. And we're going to look at what are the practices of our faith that we are then transformed, changed from who we are, renewed into the image of Jesus Christ, that it would stick in us that we would be forever changed. And yeah, we're going to experience some failures along the way. He's going to expose sin that's still there. But the process leads to permanence. And so as we end in Nehemiah, I want you to think this. The whole story of Nehemiah ain't about Nehemiah. It's not about a wall. It's not even about necessarily the people. What's it about? It's about God. And who is God that we have seen through the whole book of Nehemiah? Faithful merciful, steadfast, who does not cast off his people, who will not forsake them, who is committed to the process of renewal of all things, which means you, your marriage, your family, your community, this entire world. And so we know that we can trust our lives, our families, our marriages, our communities, our world to him, trust it to the process, for he will bring renewal. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are the God of renewal and that even when we are faithless again and again, you are faithful. Father, I pray for all my friends in this room. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would give them eyes and ears to see in their own life a room that they have rented out to a Tobiah. And Father, I pray that your spirit would help uproot that by your grace and bring it out, that they would experience new life. Father, I pray that you would keep us humble, keep us in your love, keep us filled with mercy and grace towards one another as we journey together towards Jesus. Help us to stay humble before the world. Help us to stay honest that our convictions and our confessions are not just lip service, but are true in our hearts. Help us to be the people of God. It's in the name of your son that we ask this. Amen.